Well, thank you so much, Alison. I know we don't do it every time, but we, we could applaud just about every time you get done with an offertory. We really could. It's, well, then there you go. Um, I want to thank so many that do so much here for the church. Also, a quick reminder, if you um, would like a prayer sheet, there are some at the welcome desk. And at, um, uh, in the foyer as well, our new um, monthly missionary sheets with uh, the updates we've, got, we've received from our various missionaries. I think they are, if they're not at the uh, front uh, desk, they're on the mission table, so you can look for those. And um, hey, we, we, we've got an exciting morning ahead of us. And I'm, I'm most excited because the way the Packers have been playing lately, that we can just go right on till three and you won't miss anything, right? <laughs> And I, I'm a Packer fan, so, you know, it, it hurts. Let me tell you, it hurts sometimes. But um, anyway, to start off this morning, we are in the book of Revelation, and there's a lot of judgment in Revelation. It, it talks about what is yet to come. And there's a quote, an idea that has been voiced by many people, but um, kind of made famous in part by Tupac Shakur. Uh, how many of you actually know who that was? few of you, that's good, that's good, especially for some of our older people here to know this name, a rapper who uh, was shot to death, but he, uh, he, he said, only God can judge me. And there are two things that strike me about that quote, particularly in relationship to the book of Revelation and particularly what we're looking at this morning. Uh, that's a very dangerous thing to ask for, Right? I mean, it, you, you, think, you think you're going to be saved in some way by God judging you? You better be careful because uh, we know that God judges sin and that there's only one way to know him and to escape judgment, and that's through Jesus Christ. So someone who presumably does not know God to want God's judgment, very dangerous. The other thing that I think strikes me in relationship to Revelation 15 is that in, in reality there's some truth to this statement. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about this morning. God is judge, we are not. So you can join with me in looking at Revelation 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast in its image, and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much for your word to us. I pray, Lord, that you will help, me to understand, help us to understand this, help me to proclaim it, help me to explain it. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray if there's anyone here struggling in their relationship with you or struggling to know you, that through the power of your word, through the power of your spirit, you will reach out to them, open their hearts, open their minds, open their eyes so that they can see you. And I pray, Lord, as a result of being here, we will all become closer to you today. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, judgment is a recurring theme throughout the book of Revelation. But again here, we're reminded that judgment is coming. God reveals here that judgment is coming. Once again, Revelation 15, 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And whether you see Revelation as a sequence of sequential events, one right after the other, or you see it as a cycle, the bowls, the trumpets, the, um, um, the seals, all representing an intensification of the same thing, here's the reminder that judgment is coming, and it's going to happen. 
And this idea of a sign has been used in Revelation before. And a sign in the book of Revelation seems to be something that signifies uh, an event with theological meaning that is happening in history in one way, shape, or form. Revelation 12, 1, for example. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of seven stars. This represented, we said, probably the nation of Israel. And talking about the coming birth of the Messiah, Revelation 12, 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. Once again, representing the, the world system, perhaps even... Um, being a, a, a literal individual. So you have these signs that are depicted in symbolic form, but they represent something that is literally happening. So when we read about this sign in heaven, I don't think this is just, just a vision. This is, this is a representation of something that is actually happening. And what is going to happen, of course, is judgment. What's happening here right now that we're going to talk about in a little bit is worship. But the whole chapter is talking about God's judgment. And it is certain. It is going to happen. Not only is judgment coming, and this is a reminder of the judgment that has been promised and promised and promised finally happening. You might say, well, gosh, hasn't it already happened? Well, precursors to judgment have happened. A form of judgment has happened. There is a final judgment yet to come, and it is absolutely certain. Revelation 15:5. and after this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. I want to just talk about this for a minute, because this is really interesting, this idea of the tent of witness. Why, why would there be a tent of witness in heaven? Well, it goes back to the nation of Israel in the uh, Old Testament, actually. Uh, Acts 7.44 talks about it. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. There was a tabernacle they had. It was called the tent of witness for a very important reason. Exodus 32.15, Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony his hand, the Ten Commandments, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. So what happened to these tablets? Well, Exodus 40, 20, and 21, he took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. And if we have a pictorial representation about what the tabernacle looked like in the wilderness it was set up, uh, it had the, the, the outer boundary, it had the altar, and then it had a sanctuary kind of on one end of it and the sanctuary was split in two, and in the back of the sanctuary was the most holy place. That's where the ark was, with the Ten Commandments, with the testimony of God, with the witness of God. And that's why it was called the Tabernacle of Witness, because God's word was within the tabernacle. So talking about the Tabernacle of Witness in heaven, this is a reminder that God and his word are true and will happen, that this judgment is certain. Um, Psalm 1830, This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. This reminder that the tabernacle of witnesses in heaven is a reminder that God does what he says he will do. He said judgment was coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is certain. It's going to happen. He promised it. It's going to happen. He is testimony to his own truth. And his judgment is his. And this is a reminder that I think we, we take from this passage, but also from other places in Scripture. But uh, once again, looking at the passage, Revelation 15, 6 through 8, out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests, and one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. God is going to do this because he is God. Because it's his prerogative. It's his right. And it is his promise. He said he was going to judge the earth for its sinfulness. But notice that it is God's prerogative to judge. We read this in Jude 9. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So is 
Michael doing what we're expected to do, or is this something specific to this event in history? Well, in Romans 12, 19, we read, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There is a significant number of people in this world that want vengeance on others, vengeance on other groups, want to get back at people. Um, and, and we're told in Scripture that that is not what we are supposed to be about as believers. We are supposed to be merciful. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. He even gave us a parable about it in Luke 10, starting in verse 29. Um, but a gentleman, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him in his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. We are supposed to be a merciful people if we are God's people. And then we read this in Luke 6, 32-36. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful." So, yes, God is just and judge, but he is also merciful. And here on this earth, we are to emulate his mercy because he is the one who is judged. Now, does this mean we can't recognize evil? Does this mean that evil shouldn't be punished? Of course not. But we have to understand that in our own lives and hearts, harboring hatred is wrong. Seeking personal retaliation and retribution is wrong wrong. We need to make sure that we don't harbor ill will for other people in our hearts. And, and that way, when, when the justice system um, does what it's supposed to do, it does it, but we do not take specific personal satisfaction in that. Because we should want to see people do right and do good and turn to God and, 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 and be rehabilitated and all of those things. Judgment is not ours. Here we're reminded that judgment is God's. And it's going to happen. It's certain to happen. We're waiting for it to happen. And we just have to live here on this earth in the midst of evil while we're waiting for his judgment. But while we're waiting, we have a reminder that we will overcome. God's people will overcome. Revelation 15, 2, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now the sea we saw in verse, uh, at chapter 4, verse 6 was before the throne. And mingled with fire, well, gosh, could it foreshadow the coming judgment? Could it represent the Spirit of God? Could it just be an example of God's glory? I don't know, and neither does anyone else who writes about this passage because the opinions are all over the map. But it's the sea of glass is there. Here it's mingled with fire. And those who conquered the beast in its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hand. And harps have always been instruments of praise. Uh, Psalm 81, 1 and 2. Sing aloud to God our strength, shout for joy to the God of Jacob, raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. So here the crowd is worshiping and praising God before the throne. They're not just singing, they're using instruments. It's like a worship service. And they're praising God. But... Um, many look at this and say, well, these people 
are the Jewish believers who were martyred during the tribulation, the Jewish male believers who were martyred, and they've been given a special dispensation to be before the throne. And here they are worshiping and praising God, even though they've been martyred. Others say this is a representation of the church throughout history before the throne of God, worshiping and praising him. And depending on how you view Revelation, depends on how you view that. I'm fairly confident in saying that this could represent anyone, any believer, not just martyrs, because of what has been written in Revelation before, which is why I feel comfortable taking a passage like this and, and seeking to apply it specifically to our lives and, and, and the way we are to live right now, not just looking for something in the future, not just looking at something in the past, but seeing Revelation as essentially important and relevant for where we are right now because we are called to overcome and we can overcome and we will overcome. And we're reminded in the book of Revelation that the overcomers will be with God before his throne because of the specific messages to the seven churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation. We're reminded with each one of those letters to each one of the ch churches that all who conquer will eat of the tree of life, not be hurt by the second death, be given hidden manna and a new name, receive the morning star, have Jesus confess their names to the Father. They will be citizens of heaven and they will sit with Jesus on his throne. So while it's tempting to look at this passage of Scripture and say, okay, it's just talking about a specific group of people. No, we overcome in our own lives by being true to God, by being witnesses of his, by remaining firm in the face of persecution. All those things he was talking to the first seven churches about at the beginning of the book of Revelation. When we are firm, when we follow God, when we obey him, when we live for him, we overcome and these promises are ours Two, they're ours. We have to endure. We have to have faith. We have to stand firm in the midst of persecution, in the midst of a world that hates us, in the midst of a world where Satan is actively trying to bring out our down, about our downfall and our demise. We remain firm, and we will eat of the tree of life. We will not be hurt by the second death. We receive the morning star, which is Jesus Christ. We will be citizens of heaven, and we will sit with Jesus on his throne. Those are our promises as overcomers. So I don't think it's a, a mistake here or just a coincidence that the word overcomer or, or, um, is, used here in, in, or, um, is used here in Revelation. Now I've got to go back. Am I uh, making a mistake? Am I using King James and New King James language? Uh, conquerors. Conquerors. We're conquerors, okay? Conquerors. Same word. Same idea. We are conquerors. We overcome. We are his. And when we are his, we are his forever. Amen? Amen. 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 And we will praise him for his deliverance, just as they are praising him for deliverance here. Revelation 15, 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now this goes back once again to the Old Testament. So much in the book of Revelation goes back to the Old Testament. We've talked about it to uh, Ezekiel, to Daniel, to Isaiah, to the Psalms, I mean, you, you name it, to the Garden of Eden. So much to the Garden of Eden, to the Exodus and this is one of those things that goes back to God bringing his people out of Egypt. And he has just you know, drowned the Egyptian army in the, uh, the Red Sea. And in Exodus 15, 1 and 2, we read, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. This is the song of Moses, a, a, a reminder uh, that God has delivered us. God has saved us. He does that for us through Jesus Christ. You see, we're reminded in Scripture that everyone on this earth has done wrong in God's sight. We are all sinners. That's what the Bible says we are. We are all sinners. No one is exempt. We're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. And we stand before God condemned. 
This is why it's so dangerous to think, oh, only God can judge me. Well, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's really bad if you are in this sinful, condemned state when you stand before God at the judgment seat. Okay? But God loves us, wants us to know him, wants us to be forgiven of our sin. And that's why Jesus Christ left heaven, came to this earth, and lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross in our place. There's a whole bunch in the Old Testament in the Bible that talks about what the sacrificial system was for the nation of Israel and what it meant. But basically what it means is this. We're all sinners. We can't approach God unless we've been forgiven. The only way we can be forgiven is by the giving of life, the shedding of blood. And that's what Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus Christ gave his life. He shed his blood. He died for us. He died in our place so that we could be forgiven, so that we could know God, so that we could have a home in heaven, so that we could overcome, so that we could be conquerors. That's what Jesus did for us. But we have to believe. We have to believe. We have to say to God, God, I know I've sinned. I know I've done wrong. I know I don't deserve to be in your presence. But I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for me. I believe that he took the punishment I deserved on himself when he died on the cross. And he did it so that I could be saved. He did it so that I could be forgiven. He did it so that I could have a relationship with you. And that's when we become his. And that's when we can sing the song of deliverance, the song of salvation. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And then we see an even greater image of God here because we not only praise him for deliverance, but we praise him for his attributes. His attributes. That's, we praise him basically for who he is. So it's a theological way of saying that. And you might say, well, Pastor, why don't you just say that to begin with? Well, it, it's the way I studied, okay? That's just the way it is. But we praise him for who he is. We praise him for, for what he has done. He is, first of all, he is good and wise. Here it says, great and amazing are your deeds. He, his deeds are great and amazing because he only does what is good, he only does what is wise. When we think about the, the attributes of God, we think about his goodness and his wisdom. Uh, his goodness is that God is the final standard of all good and he, all that he is and does is worthy of approval. And his wisdom, God always chooses the best goals and the best means to those goals. So when Great and amazing are your deeds. When we read that, it reminds us that they're great and amazing because he's good and wise. I mean, that's the wonderful thing, and we can trust him and, and what's going on. And when we don't understand what is happening in the world or why it is happening, we understand that he brings good out of it, and he is doing wise things behind the scenes, things that we can't even begin to understand, things that we can't even begin to know. But he is doing them because that is who he is. Psalm 111.7, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. And then he is sovereign. Our, O oh Lord God, the Almighty is what the saints here are singing. Almighty uh, of God is used ten times in the New Testament. Nine times of them are in Revelation. Nine times. Used a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, the only other time it's used in the New Testament is in, in uh, Corinthians. But Here's the reminder, God is almighty, he is sovereign, he is in charge, he is in control. Jeremiah 10.10 10 says, But the Lord is the true God, he is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Here is the reminder that in his sovereignty he is also the one who brings about judgment, which we will get to. He is also just, just and true are your ways. Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4 says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. So many are quick to, to fault God for the things we see that are wrong in the world, the things we, we don't understand, um, the, the evil and the evil deeds that are done and, and natural disasters. But if we truly believe that God is just, we understand that he has a, a reason behind what is happening, or better yet, a reason behind allowing what is happening. Because he doesn't always just decree that everything bad is going to happen, but he allows it because he can bring good out of it. He does bring good out of it. He does bring good out of it in people's lives. Not only believers becoming closer to him, but unbelievers becoming his. 
the bad in our lives is so often what makes us more his than the good. And that's something we always have to recognize in our lives. And, and we, so many are quick to say, oh, that's unjust. Well, we don't know the whole story, do we? That's just like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you look at him, he, he, he didn't do anything wrong, he was teaching people, and yet he was arrested and unjustly tried and put to death. And you can say, well, that, that's, just, that's wrong, that's, that's just not right. But there was a reason behind it. That's because God is just and sin had to be judged. And in Jesus it was judged and there was a greater reason and a purpose behind it. Everything that God does is just. All his ways are justice. And he's king. O king of the nations. Uh, We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But um, once again, Jeremiah 10.10, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath the earthquakes, the nations cannot endure his indignation. He is Lord. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? And, And God revealed himself to Moses and revealed himself in such a way to, to, to show Moses who he was and is and to reveal some of his attributes to him in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. He passed by Moses as Moses was hiding from him because he couldn't look on God. And we read there, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and sin, but who by no means will clear the guilty. And there is the reminder that God is just and he is holy, as well as being merciful and forgiving. And once again, that is why Jesus had to die. Because he couldn't just overlook the sin that we had done. Somebody had to pay for it. Jesus willingly went to the cross to pay for it. God is both forgiving and just. He is merciful and and holy, and it's all a part of him being Lord. He alone, in fact, is holy. One of his greatest attributes, in fact, is repeated three times in the book of Revelation, directly from the book of Isaiah. It's, one of, it's his only attribute that is repeated over and over and over again. Holy, holy, holy. Revelation 4, 8 And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes and around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He is holy. And then I I have an extra one in here. This is the extra one because I pulled it not from the main chunk in the middle here, which is a song of praise, but because of, of a statement at the end of the passage we are looking at this morning. He is eternal, who lives forever and ever. Psalm 92 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He is eternal. He is always, has always been there, will always be there. He is the one constant in the universe. And then he is judge. Uh, One of the biggest reasons for the book of Revelation, one of the major ways is revealed here in chapter 15, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Uh, It kind of had a foreshadowing of this in Isaiah 66, 15 and 16. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. It's an exact depiction of what we're seeing here in Revelation 15 forward. And once again, maybe that's why the glass has bits of fire in it as a direct reference back to this verse and his rebuke with flames of fire. I mean, God is judge, and we should be fearful of his judgment unless we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, because then we know we are saved, then we know we are secure, then we know we will be with him in heaven forever. Um, But then I have a statement here that's really a question. All will fear and worship. Could be a statement, could be a question. All nations will come and worship you. And I I say it could be a statement or it could be a question because 
what does this actually mean when it says all nations will come and worship you? And, and what I mean by that is, could it be that representatives from all nations will come and worship you? In fact, most of the New Testament is proclaiming the wonderful glory of God and how he has brought Jew and Gentile together. And, and they're part of the church, and they're saved the same way, by grace through faith. And now they are together and worshiping God, and all nations, in effect, are together worshiping God like it is here. So is this just talking about believers from every nation will end up worshiping God? We have a passage like Zechariah 8, 20 through 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Is this just all nations saying that people from everywhere, all different tribes, all different tongues, all different nations, will eventually be before the throne of God, worshiping him? Or does it literally mean all nations, literally all people? And we go to a passage like Philippians 2, 9 through 11, talking about Jesus Christ. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So if this is all literal, then that means that one day, everyone, regardless of what they believe, will be forced to bend the knee before God, before his throne, before Jesus Christ. But you know what? For those that have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, by then it will be too late. Too late. So the question is simply this this morning. Wouldn't it be better to do it now? Before it's too late. Bend your knee now. Because when you bend your knee, you become God's. You know, you know him. You have his spirit living in your life. You have a wonderful home waiting for you in heaven. You become an overcomer in all the promises that go with it. And you don't have to fear judgment. And instead of knowing God as judge, you know him as Savior and Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for all those here that know you, that don't have to fear your judgment seat, that, that are overcomers, they're conquerors, Lord. Conquerors. We are conquerors when we know you. You, you help to bring us through, you guide us, you direct us, you help us to remain strong through your spirit. Thank you for your promises to us, Lord. Thank you for the promise of a home in heaven. And, and, and help us to remember that in the midst of this world and what, where we are living, that part of being an overcomer is, is not taking on your job of judgment. I mean, you are judged, we are not. We are to be as merciful as we can possibly be we are, while we are down here because, quite honestly, you have shown us mercy, more mercy than we deserved. We, we lived our lives for us. We spat in your face. We didn't care until one day we did through the power of your Spirit in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us to endure. Help us to persevere. Help us to be overcomers. And dear Heavenly Father, remind us too that we need to share about your love with those around us so that we can see others become overcomers too. And help us, dear Heavenly Father, to, to, to continue to have hearts of compassion to those around us, even though, as I've said before, it does seem like there, there's going to come a point in time as revealed in the book of Revelation, we'll just be, we'll be crying out, things are so bad, we'll all just be crying out, Lord, come now. Doesn't matter if judgment comes, come now. Doesn't matter, just, just come. It seems like we will get to that point. But un until that time, Lord, help us to be merciful and compassionate and want to see uh, as many people come to know you as, can, as they can. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.